On September the 15th of 2022, Florida woman Nicole Cardona was taken into police custody for selling fraudulent handicap parking placards in the Miami area. An investigation was launched by Miami Beach Police after a detective witnessed a man using a handicap permit under suspicious circumstances. When questioned, the man admitted to purchasing the placard illegally. He reportedly paid Cardona $150 for the fake permit after learning about her services from a co-worker at his restaurant job around this time. The Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office reported that they were receiving numerous complaints about motorists abusing disabled placards in order to park their vehicles in restricted residential neighborhoods. Law enforcement orchestrated two sting operations in an attempt to catch Cardona in the act. The undercover detectives bought handicapped parking placard applications from the woman in exchange for a copy of their driver's licenses and payment of $200. The completed application supplied by Cardona featured signatures from two different medical doctors, both of whom denied signing the documents themselves. As a result, the 26-year-old was arrested on charges of organized scheme to defraud, forgery, false official statements, and criminal use of a public record. She was taken to jail and held on a $20,500 bond. Number 8. Jimmy Jong For over a decade, a young Georgia man concealed his involvement in the largest Bitcoin theft in the history of the United States. Back in September of 2012, Jimmy Jong from Gainesville reportedly identified a flaw in the online black market known as Silk Road. The Darknet platform, which had only been launched a year prior, enabled users to buy and sell illicit products using Bitcoin to conduct the transactions. As reported by the Justice Department, Jong was able to deceive Silk Road's operating system into depositing over 50,000 Bitcoin into his accounts by carrying out nearly 150 transactions in rapid succession. The man, a University of Georgia alum, used a total of nine different Silk Road accounts to keep his identity a secret. At the time of the heist, the cryptocurrency that Jong had stolen amounted to roughly $600,000. Ten years later, it had appreciated to an estimated value of $3.4 billion. In the years following the theft, he used the money to bankroll an opulent lifestyle. Jong explained away his immense wealth to friends by claiming to have mined large amounts of Bitcoin back when the cryptocurrency was still relatively new. The billion-dollar scammer's downfall was set into motion inadvertently in 2019. He reportedly moved a small portion of the pilfered Bitcoin to a cryptocurrency exchange that required a more comprehensive identity verification process. Agents from the IRS's Criminal Investigation Division eventually uncovered the man's massive theft. In November of 2021, his Gainesville home was raided, leading to the seizure of over 50,000 Bitcoin. Jong cooperated with authorities during the ensuing criminal process, pleading guilty to one count of committing wire fraud. During the spring of 2023, he was sentenced to 366 days in federal prison. Number 7. Sirilak Fatima Chamali Sydney woman Sirilak Fatima Chamali was accused of participating in a $9.7 million fraud scheme that primarily targeted the Thai Australian community. The 27-year-old, a Thai native herself, allegedly ripped off roughly 60 unsuspected men in a sophisticated romance scam. As part of the deception, Chimali at various points posed as a legal, medical and flight student while advertising herself on sugar daddy dating websites. However, in reality, she was living lavishly, indulging in thousands of dollars worth of high-end fashion items, which she purchased with stolen money. The woman also pretended to be a licensed remitter, offering absurdly inflated rates for currency exchanges. In all, after she was arrested in February of 2020, she faced 57 counts of dishonestly obtaining financial advantage by deception. Chamali appeared in New South Wales Supreme Court via webcam, representing herself during her criminal trial. In December of 2022, it was reported that she'd been sentenced to an aggregate total of four years and two months behind bars. Number 6. Brenton Fillers According to an Alabama woman identified only as Trisha, she was scammed by a man she met on TikTok. 
the individual identified himself as Jason Mitchell and the pair reportedly started hanging out on the eastern shore of Mobile Bay in southwest Alabama. Mitchell, however, was actually a serial fraudster by the name of Brenton Fillers, aged 54. The latter eventually stole Trisha's car after offering to house it for her. She reported it missing to Spanish Fort Police. Local investigators subsequently coordinated with law enforcement in the city of Daphne, who were also looking into fillers at the time. Before his association with Trisha, the man had accompanied a woman from West Virginia down to Alabama. The pair were en route to Texas, but while they were staying at a hotel in Daphne, Phyllis left the woman behind, making off with her credit card and the rental car. The man was nicknamed the TikTok Trickster because of his proclivity to target victims on social media. In April of 2023, he was tracked down in Lexington, Kentucky, where he was finally taken into police custody for his crimes. At the time of his arrest, Phyllis was wanted in Alabama, Texas, Tennessee, and Kentucky, and already had a criminal history in Iowa and Arkansas. He faced a number of criminal charges, including felony fraudulent use of a credit card, theft of property, and aggravated assault of a child. Number 5. T.J. Fletcher A man from Western Gateway, London, was arrested for spearheading a website known as iSpoof which touted itself as an online fraud marketplace where criminals could acquire the tools necessary to perpetrate various schemes. As lead administrator of the site, which launched in December of 2020, TJ Fletcher offered multiple different services to prospective patrons in exchange for a monthly subscription fee. The man's criminal customers were given the ability to spoof their caller IDs to make it look like they were from legitimate financial institutions. iSpoof users would use their altered caller IDs along with other tools offered by Fletcher to gain the trust of their victims before accessing their bank accounts and draining their capital. UK authorities reported that as a direct result of iSpoof, more than 200,000 people were scammed out of over $50 million. When expanded to include victims from the rest of the world, iSpoof reportedly stole roughly $125 million in total. As the mastermind behind the website, Fletcher pocketed an estimated $2.5 million worth of Bitcoin, which he used to purchase multiple luxury vehicles and rent an upscale East London apartment. Inside the man's flat, police came upon a money counter, jewelry, and a Rolex watch. He was taken into custody at his girlfriend's home where investigators found a $290,000 Lamborghini parked outside. He eventually pleaded guilty to making or supplying articles for use in fraud, encouraging or assisting the commission of an offense, possessing criminal property and transferring criminal property. In May of 2023, Fletcher was sentenced to 13 years and four months behind bars. Number 4. Charmaine McAllister A career criminal and mother of three from the town of Boston in Lincolnshire, England, was arrested in connection with over 200 instances of fraud and theft across two decades. 37-year-old Charmaine McAllister surfaced in headlines again in December of 2023. While she was out on bail for previous offenses, the woman allegedly stole multiple people's credit cards. She then used the information to purchase cars at dealerships in Warrington and all across Cheshire before attempting to sell the vehicles on the private market. Police caught wind of McAllister's fraud spree after pulling over multiple motorists who'd purchased their cars from the woman. During the course of her prolific criminal career, McAllister reportedly stole over $125,000 through credit card scams. At various times, the serial scammer posed as a police officer, a bank employee, and even a soldier to deceive her victims. On one occasion, she managed to convince an advertising partner of Horse and Hound magazine to give her money by pretending to be an executive for the equestrian publication. Following her latest arrest, McAllister pleaded guilty to 10 counts of fraud by false representation and one count of theft by finding. She was consequently sentenced to an additional 15 months in prison. Number 3. Charlie Gervais Shortly after graduating from the Wharton Business School of the University of Pennsylvania, New York native Charlie Gervais founded a company called Frank in 2016. The technology firm advertised student aid assistance, offering help to prospective college students seeking loans and financial aid. Within its first year of operation, 
Frank was the target of a lawsuit by the United States Department of Education. Javais was accused of falsely implying to customers that her company was affiliated with the US government. The matter was settled in 2018 and Frank was forced to change its URL in accordance with the agreement. That same year, Javais faced yet another lawsuit, this time at the filing of her co-founder, Adi Omesi. In connection with alleged wage theft, she would later be ordered by the court to pay $35,000 to settle the case. In September of 2021, Javais managed to negotiate $175 million from JP Morgan Chase in exchange for her company. The following year, however, she was accused of lying about the size of Frank's user base in order to seal the deal with JP Morgan Chase. Javais reportedly told the buyers that her company was servicing over 4 million customers. When asked by JP Morgan Chase to verify those figures, the woman allegedly called upon a data science professor for a list of more than 4 million fake student identities in exchange for $18,000. In reality, though, Frank attracted fewer than 300,000 users during its history. JP Morgan sued Javice, who countersued them, claiming to have been wrongly scapegoated for the company's carelessness and lack of due diligence. In April of 2023, the former Forbes 30 Under 30 member was arrested in New Jersey on charges of wire fraud affecting a financial institution, securities fraud, bank fraud, and conspiracy. As of the latest developments, Javice's criminal case was still ongoing. Today's topic was requested by Rena Manvalova 7753, Cubonic, and Laura Hooper 7609. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Logan Paul In 2021, prominent YouTuber, podcaster, and WWE champion Logan Paul got himself in hot water for promoting a failed cryptocurrency game that caused many of his fans to lose money. The internet star urged members of his considerable following to purchase NFTs as part of a project called CryptoZoo, which he described as a really fun game that makes you money. The game was intended to be a virtual experience that allowed users to buy, sell, and breed digital animals. However, Paul eventually abandoned the project prior to its completion, having already sold millions of dollars worth of cryptocurrency collectibles to his fans. In December of 2022, another popular YouTuber, CoffeeZilla, called out the Ohio native for scamming his supporters. Following CoffeeZilla's expose, Paul issued a public apology, expressing a desire to make this right for fans who lost money on CryptoZoo. He announced the start of a buyback program in which he vowed to give $2.3 million of his own money back to those affected. In January of 2024, Paul finally made good on his word, promising to partially refund CryptoZoo investors who agreed not to sue him. Straight after number one, we'll line up our release about when arguing over small debts goes totally wrong. Stick around if you haven't seen that one yet. Number one, Melbourne scammers. In October of 2023, Australian woman Rachel De Candia from Melbourne received an email claiming that she'd erroneously been charged twice for her Netflix subscription. The 28-year-old was reportedly prompted to fill out her banking information in order to be issued a refund. The following week, De Candia received a phone call from a private number. The caller identified themselves as a fraud security worker for National Australia Bank. The individual informed De Candia that her bank account and cards had been compromised. She was told to transfer all of her money out of the account, as well as send in her bank cards for forensic inspection. De Candia complied with the fraud expert's instructions, moving roughly $6,000 into a new account that the bank had supposedly set up for her. Hours later, De Candia heard a knock at her door. An Uber had been sent to her home to pick up her bank cards, which the woman later said struck her as weird. Panicked, she nevertheless handed over both of her debit cards. Within the hour, the cards had been used to make several purchases totaling $28,629. By the time Deacon Dia realized that she'd been swindled, 
and contacted her banks, the scammers had already drained each of her accounts. As it turned out, the criminals used the woman's bank info obtained in the initial phishing email about her Netflix account to legitimize the phone call from their purported fraud expert. According to law enforcement, the thieves would likely convert the stolen money into cryptocurrency, making it nearly impossible to track them down. The $35,000 that Dee Candia ultimately lost was meant to be put towards a down payment for a house, but she was forced to put those plans on hold. 32-year-old Tennessee man Michael D. Robinson shot his girlfriend's 18-year-old son over a $5 debt in the early morning hours of July the 12th of 2021. Robinson and Zakoon Harris had reportedly gotten into an argument outside the Memphis home where Zakoon's mother lived. Robinson at one point retrieved a shotgun from his car and fired at the teen once in the chest. He then moved his car a short distance from the house located on the 800 block of Randall Street. When police arrived, the victim was lying in the driveway, unresponsive, and was later pronounced dead at the scene. His mother, Consquela Harris, identified Robinson, her boyfriend, as the shooter when speaking with officers. The suspect was arrested and admitted to the shooting, according to a charging document. He was booked at the Shelby County Jail without bond. In June of 2022, a grand jury indicted Robinson on a first-degree murder charge. Because he was a repeat offender, the District Attorney's Special Prosecution Unit sought the maximum sentence. Robinson's criminal record included multiple drug charges, possession of a firearm, vandalism, and aggravated assault. Number 6. Gregory Lanier Robertson on August 11th of 2022, Oakland County Sheriff's deputies were called to a General Motors assembly plant in Orion Township, Michigan, where they found a man unconscious and bleeding. The deputies attempted to resuscitate 49-year-old Gregory Lanier Robertson from Pontiac, but they were unsuccessful and Robertson was pronounced dead at the scene. Officers found the victim's fellow contracted cleaning service employee Astrid Gijon Bushi near the plant's loading dock. The 48-year-old Albanian national apparently surrendered himself and was charged with open murder. According to autopsy results, Robertson's death was ruled a homicide from multiple blows to the head. The police revealed that the altercation had centered around a small outstanding debt. A jury found Bushy guilty of premeditated murder in the first degree. Seven weeks later, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Number 5. Laura Ann Palmer, Terran Joseph Morrow, and Drake Duncan O'Neill. On September the 7th of 2019, a woman visited 35-year-old Laura Ann Palmer at an apartment near Tulsa, Oklahoma, in connection with $180 in outstanding debts. Palmer and two accomplices made sure the victim couldn't leave the flat located in the 1700 block of South Memorial Drive until the money was returned, according to a probable cause affidavit. The woman denied having taken anything, after which she had a gun pointed at her by one of the accomplices, later identified as 30-year-old Drake Duncan O'Neill. The latter reportedly threatened to kill her if the debt wasn't paid. He was then instructed by Palmer to have the woman searched in the bathroom. O'Neill subsequently assaulted the victim, and after he was done, the other accomplice, 44-year-old Terran Joseph Morrow, went into the bathroom and repeated the abuse. Palmer then allegedly entered the bathroom and inserted a gun into the victim's privates. She threatened to pull the trigger if the money wasn't returned and proceeded to torture the woman over the next two days. The victim was punched, sliced with a razor blade, doused in acid, and had a power tool drilled into her arm. She eventually managed to escape, at which point she reported the ordeal to local authorities. She reportedly had several large bruises, a bite mark on her upper body, a split upper lip, and two black eyes. When police went to the scene, the suspects were already gone, but they'd left behind a power drill and a black 22 caliber revolver. A police sergeant later said that it was the most brutal crime she'd ever seen perpetrated by a woman. On October the 27th of 2019, Morrow was arrested as part of a routine drug investigation in Medway, Maine. O'Neill was arrested under the same circumstances at a Gateway Inn in Maine two days later. Both suspects were later extradited back to Oklahoma. At around 10 p.m. on November the 2nd of 2019, Palmer was spotted in a vehicle in West Tulsa, whereupon she too was arrested. According to a case report, the suspects were sentenced for the crime on April the 19th of 2021. Palmer entered a plea of no contest and was convicted of possession of a firearm after a previous conviction of a felony and assault and battery with a dangerous weapon. Morrow pleaded guilty and was convicted of the same charge. O'Neill 
entered a guilty plea and was convicted of feloniously pointing a firearm. He was ordered to serve four years in the custody of the Department of Corrections. Number four, Charlie Bates. On July the 31st of 2022, teenager Charlie Bates was stabbed in a car park in Radstock, Somerset, England after an argument over a $24 debt. While Bates and his friends were on the benches near the parking lot at around 6.30 p.m., two vehicles pulled up to the area, according to an eyewitness. The victim approached one of the cars and spoke with the driver before a one-on-one -on -one fistfight suddenly broke out. A few more people from both parties ended up joining in until 18-year-old Joshua Del Bono came out of one of the cars with a knife and plunged it into Bates several times. Joshua and his group fled the scene and Bates was pronounced dead less than an hour later. The suspect headed straight into Shearwater, near Warminster, where he disposed of the murder weapon and burned his clothes. He then went to his family's residence in Frome and confided in his sister about the attack. The sister later told their mother, Donna, who confronted Joshua in his room. He confessed to his mother, indicating he was scared and didn't know what to do. Donna told him that the only thing he could do was hand himself into the authorities. She dialed 999 and reported that her son had killed someone. Hi, um, I'm through. Okay, um, what's happening? Uh, my son's killed someone. Okay, all right, okay. Can you tell me where? Um, it was at Radstock earlier. He's just come back. I've just found out he's in my house now, but I can't just let him go anywhere. Does he know you're on the phone? Yeah, he's here. I told oh. him I've got to do it. Joshua then got on the phone and claimed that he'd only joined the fight to help his friend and that he didn't know anything about the victim. A short time later, he was arrested and charged with murder. During the resulting trial in March of 2023, a friend of Bates, who was involved in the fight as well, appeared in Bristol Crown Court as a witness. According to his testimony, Joshua attempted to stab him with a rusty serrated blade. After he backed away and fell down, the next thing he saw was Bates being kicked and punched on the ground and then stabbed in the heart. A pathologist told the court that the victim had stabbed wounds to his chest and arm, which was consistent with self-defense. On April the 11th of 2023, Joshua was found guilty by a unanimous verdict and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 21 years. Number three, Jordan Marples Douglas. A small debt owed by 23-year-old Jordan Marples Douglas led to him being fatally stabbed on Woodthorpe Road in Sheffield, England on March the 6th of 2020. The attackers, 26-year-old Ben Jones and Ismail Mohamud Adan, had visited the victim's residence prepared for a fight. According to South Yorkshire Police, after they forcibly entered the home, they repeatedly stabbed Marples Douglas in the bedroom. A combination of internal injuries and loss of blood resulted in the victim's death. After the killing, the pair of suspects went back to a house owned by Jones's father, where they were reportedly heard talking about the incident. Upon the arrival of authorities at the scene, two knives with the victim's DNA were recovered, as well as a hat that belonged to Jones. On March the 10th, Jones was arrested while Adan had already fled the country with the aid of his girlfriend. The fugitive booked himself a flight to Somalia with his partner's bank card. During the proceedings for Jones's trial at Sheffield Crown Court, the prosecution said that the motive for the killing was a drug debt. After the four-week trial, Jones was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 21 years. 22-year-old Dinah Awimrin, Adan's lover, was found guilty of assisting an offender and sentenced to three years behind bars. The latest updates on the matter seem to suggest that Adan remained on the run. Number two, Gerardo Munez de la Paz. On the morning of January the 29th of 2020, Texas authorities came upon a bullet-riddled body on the 20,900 block of Robert Cemetery Road in Hockley. According to the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office, members of law enforcement agencies were dispatched to the scene where the remains were recovered. The deceased was identified as 51-year-old Magnolia man, Gerardo Munoz de la Paz. Detectives identified 39-year-old Melvin Giovanni Ramirez Russell as a suspect through video footage. He was arrested two days later without incident and admitted to fatally shooting De La Paz, who was his friend and disposing of the body because the victim owed him over $700. In his confession, Ramirez Russo said that before he fired his gun, De La Paz had attacked him. The suspect was nevertheless charged with murder. 
tampering with evidence to conceal a human corpse and tampering with evidence to impair an investigation. According to a statement by the district attorney's office, the victim was shot multiple times in the chest and left arm with a 38 caliber pistol at close range. Five days later, 37-year-old Juan Manuel Amaya Pavon was also arrested for allegedly assisting the suspect with the disposal of the body. He was charged with tampering with evidence to conceal a human corpse. Ramirez Roussel was held on a $410,000 bond while Pavon's bail was set at $75,000. In the 221st District Court on August the 17th of 2020, Ramirez Roussel pleaded guilty and received a 45-year sentence. Number 1. Alison McBlain Alison McBlain and Christian Rivers were walking down the street in Blackburn, Lancashire, England on November the 19th of 2020 when they were suddenly hit by a car. According to Lancashire Police, a day prior to the incident, the pair had arranged to buy $80 worth of drugs from Dean Quayam and Khalib Connolly, who were members of a gang called Bully Line. When McBlain and Rivers made off without paying for the illicit merchandise, 21-year-old Quayam and Connolly, aged 19, plotted retaliation with their gang leader, 26-year-old John Chatwood. On the night of the attack at around 7.30 p.m., another member of Bully Line, 28-year-old Caris Poynton, saw McBlain in a pharmacy on King Street and phoned his accomplices. Ten minutes later, McBlain and Rivers were struck by the vehicle. The former left a shoe mark on the hood of the Fiat Punto after she was thrown across the front of the car, eventually landing 42 feet away on the pavement. The impact on the curb reportedly left the car with a deflated tire. Connolly, Quayam, and two other occupants abandoned the car after the collision and fled to Walsh Street, where Chatwood resided. Rivers survived the revenge attack, but McBlain passed away in the hospital two days later. According to the Chief Inspector of the Division of Criminal Investigation, the victims were deliberately run over in a calculated, premeditated revenge slaying. She added that McBlain's family and friends were left utterly heartbroken by the tragedy. Authorities conducted a major investigation that led to the arrest of six suspects in total. A five-week trial began on January the 4th of 2021 and concluded with only five convictions as one suspect was still a minor. Quayam and Connolly were found guilty of murder and attempted murder. They were sentenced to life with minimum terms of 20 and 14 years respectively. Poynton and one of the occupants of the car used during the incident, 27-year-old Joshua Titterington, were found guilty of murder and attempted grievous bodily harm and were sentenced to life with minimum terms of 13 years and 17 and a half years respectively. Finally, Chatwood was found guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to 14 years behind bars. Thanks for watching. Would you rather fall victim to a romance scam or learn that your bank is actually a front for the mob? Let us know in the comments section below.